do think this is a really important nexus between uh, nuclear weapons and climate change. And I'm, of course, going to be speaking to probably the closest point of connection between them, which is the question of nuclear power. And this is a big question because nuclear power is a low carbon energy source, and it's also a very large energy source. And so there is a real question about whether or not it has a role to play in combating global climate change. But let's talk now about the links between nuclear uh, power and nuclear weapons, even in the United States, when we're not talking about global. The types of reactors that we're interested in are, cannot use the uranium that comes straight out of the ground. When you get the uranium out of the ground, it needs to be processed through something called an enrichment plant. And it raises the percentage of one of the kinds of uranium you find relative to the other. Now, if you raise it from its uh, natural levels of about 0.7% up to 3 to 5%, you get fuel for a nuclear reactor. If you keep raising that percentage to 80 to 90 percent, you get fuel for a nuclear bomb. And the problem is, is that it's the same facilities, that all you have to do is change the plumbing. And it's the exact same piece, you just change how you run the plants to make them into uh, a facility that can make a uh, bomb fuel. Is that we have, this, we have two different technologies. The old technology is so-called gaseous diffusion. This is World War II era technology. Big plants, easy to spot, need lots of power, they emit lots of heat. You can see them from space because of their thermal signature. Easy to spot. The new technology is gas centrifuge technology. Very small facilities, you can put them underground, they don't need a lot of power, they don't need a lot of cooling. These are much easier to hide and a much bigger concern for proliferation risks, but they're also much, much cheaper, and therefore these are the facilities that we want to build. And this is the kind of plant that they're building in Iran. All of the concerns that you see with Iran right now are about a relatively modest facility. It's very, very small compared to the kinds that we're talking about, one-tenth of the size of what they want to build in New Mexico, the new enrichment plant in the U.S. So there's sort of three risks that we can talk about when we have to then begin spreading these facilities around the world to power nuclear power plants. One would be the dedicated clandestine facility. Someone learns the technology and then builds a separate facility just to make nuclear bomb fuel. And this is, for instance, what, uh, how Pakistan acquired their technology. That they got the technology uh, in part stolen from Europe, European uh, nuclear power companies, and then took that and built their own versions of these and had a dedicated facility. The second one is the diversion of highly enriched uranium, the uranium that's useful for nuclear bombs, from a declared civilian infrastructure. So you build a plant and then you just siphon a little bit off the back. Well, for a facility like this, you would need a reason to make highly enriched uranium and not bomb and not reactor fuel. And for instance, this is how South Africa got their nuclear weapons. They said that they were enriching it for a research reactor, and they built seven nuclear weapons with it. They only declared these and dismantled them at the end of apartheid, uh, when the white South African government was about to go out of power. And the last one is the one that we're talking about today, and it's the one that is the big concern for Iran. It's a path no one has yet followed, but they could which is that you take a civilian facility that was built and operated for uh, power fuel and you then convert it in the future to use for nuclear weapons. Uh, We've got a couple of kinds of waste that we have to concern yourselves with and particularly for cities and states, low-level waste is a concern. Because in, in 1985, states were given the responsibility for disposing of their own waste. And as of today, there are only 11 states that have a disposal facility for their so-called Class B and C waste. These are wastes that are more dangerous than the sort of minimal wastes. And right now they just have to be stored on site at all those reactors. If we look at the new reactor designs, these are all the new reactors that the NRC thinks may or are in some stage of being developed. Only the three that are circled are in states that have a place to dispose of their low-level waste. That this waste is around for evolutionary time scales. It's on a completely different scale than human civilization. Well, what are we planning to do with it? Uh, we want to make a, a repository, Yucca Mountain. It's been the sole site for characterization for 20 years. Uh, Nine billion dollars has already been spent. They've just recently filed the, the license application. And January 31st, 1998, was the statutory deadline to open Yucca Mountain. We're more than 10 years past and they've just applied for a license. It's one of the worst sites geologically that has ever been selected for a repository, and I do not say that lightly as a physicist. You know, this is, there are real important reasons why this is a terrible, terrible site. 
And Ernest Moniz and John Deutsch, they co-chaired the MIT study and are both former undersecretaries of energy. And they've questioned whether this thing can ever get a license with the, with the uncertainties that are around it now. And I should mention that this is another example where waste is being put on tribal land. That this land is Western Shoshone land and they have never ceded this land by treaty or by dollar. To the, to the US government, and they still maintain uh, their ancestral claim to this land. But from a nuclear weapons proliferation point of view, you have some serious problems. These facilities are very difficult to find, figure out where your plutonium comes in and goes back out. And I can give you just three examples. The top one and the bottom one are reprocessing facilities, and the middle one uh, handles the reprocessed plutonium. And they've lost uh, 200 kilograms, 70 kilograms, 50 kilograms in two years. Now, this may be stuck in the pipes, it may never have existed, but it may also, the concern is that you don't know if it walked out the door. Now, these facilities, nobody thinks that it walked out the door, but if you're trying to safeguard these facilities, these reprocessing facilities, it would be very, very difficult to know whether it was stuck in the pipes or somebody had snuck out. Eight kilograms of this kind of plutonium will make a nuclear bomb. Reflect. I recently read uh, Crazy Horse, Strange Man of the Oglalas by Mari Sandos. When he needed to, Crazy Horse would go out alone into the mountains to contemplate what was happening to his people and to reflect on the unusual behaviors in the people that were invading. He reflected on really the white man's overkill of the buffalo, that life-sustaining natural resource, the obsession with gold, and the willingness to take over the sacred Black Hills to take that gold. The willingness to kill women and children. The propensity to make promises through treaties that they didn't keep. The continued effort to modernize weapons until they controlled and dominated on the battlefield. In spite of the Indian warrior's skills and courage, What's changed over the last 140 or more years? There's no better example of the craziness of this culture than the nuclear weapon story. But we're still modernizing weapons. Right now, this country has a goal, an expressed goal, that we are devoting an awful lot of our community resources to. That goal is full spectrum dominance. Our military strategy is to control on land, in the sea, in the air, and through space. So if China, for example, with its 20 nuclear weapons, decides they want to launch one of those weapons toward the United States, our Aegis destroyer located out there in the oceans um, off China would hit that nuclear-tipped missile so that it would explode in China. Do you feel safer from that? It's a Trojan horse, folks. They call it ballistic missile defense, but it's offensive systems. America. We, we have to come to terms with the fact that America, since World War II, our industrial base has really been taken over by the Pentagon. Right? So when weapons is your major um, industrial export, what's your marketing strategy? We have to confront the reality that we are addicted to war. Our economic engines thrive on war. If we don't have war, we have surplus of weapons, and then we have a pretty significant problem in our local com communities. The military industrial complex has had a brilliant strategy of spreading itself across congressional districts throughout the country. So that when a particular Pentagon spokesperson even says we need to do away with the given weapon system, the congressional districts say, no, we need the jobs, you can't do that. It was Secretary Gates, I don't remember the weapon system, but there's a particular, um, I think it's a, a fighter plane that he doesn't want, um, but pieces of that fighter plane are built in 44 different states in this country. That's eight, as he says, that's 88 senators supporting this weapon system. How crazy is that? How unacceptable is that to us as Americans?